first of all, thanks very much for to the organizers for for inviting me here, for having me. I'm really glad to be part of that discussion, for being able to share my viewpoints here with you. Um, I think it's a very um, timely topic, um, a very exciting topic. Um, <coughs> and as you see in, in the title of my talk, Music Information Retrieval for Building Intelligent Music Creation Tools, it starts with Music Information Retrieval, and I've already heard there's some skepticism about the term Music Information Retrieval. I heard there's some passion about the term Music Information Retrieval or the field itself. Um, we also heard the um, introduction or and the definition. And don't worry, I agree with you in most of these cases. So I will give you a very similar similar talk now, um, just from my from my personal um, a take and with uh, some of the research that we've done. Um, briefly, what is the role? What can music information retrieval, what is it? And what role can it play in the process of music creation? And why is it actually important to have something like music information retrieval? Um, before I talk about that, I briefly want to introduce myself. Um, I'm a music information retrieval researcher. I would call myself that. Um, my mo most of my research is happening in the area of music search engines and interfaces um, traditionally. Um, more recently, music recommender systems, um, and um, also in the area of developing smarter tools for music creation, I won't mention this again. I uh, was a PhD and a postdoc at JKU Linz, and since 2017, I'm an assistant professor at TOV. Um, give you some more details on the on the uh, contents of my research. So I started with um, web-based MIR, I would say, things like classifying an artist based on the websites that are related to an artist, um, building text search engines, um, coming up with semantic description of, um, of audio and music artists, but always on a very multimodal level, um, trying to combine that with audio similarity measures. So not only taking one viewpoint in what is the cultural perception or something, but also what is in the content and trying to combine these different facets of, of music that are there, um, which ends up in a rather complex system. I'm not going to talk about this, um, this today, but um, with this idea of um, taking these different facets, also combining them in, in browsing interfaces, um, exploring music collections, etc., um, and most recently in the area of music recommenders. Um, and I mentioned the smarter tools for music creation. So as Sergi um, already highlighted, the Giant Steps project that was also part of, of that project. So that was a European Commission founded project until 2016. Um, um, after that, I did an FFG-funded project uh, called Smarter Jam, which was about automatic recommendation of music tracks and musicians for collaboration and online jam community. So I analyzing the audio content that musicians create in order to um, suggest or recommend to these creators what is uh, interesting content that you might want to work with, but also who are interesting people you might want to work with. Um, and also I'm involved in a research data alliance for Southeast Asian ethnomusic, which is uh, funded through Asia Uninet initiatives. That's a side project, I would say, but also very interesting. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is, um, first, as I said, um, music information retrieval. I'll give you my brief definition, or I'll give you another definition, and why, why, what I think is important about it. Um, and then I'd like to dive into one specific use case, um, that is uh, drum transcription and how we use machine learning to do that. And from that on, uh, or from using this information, um, how we use this extract information in music creation processes. Um, and then I'll, I'll discuss a bit more. And I'd like to, since many of the things have been said already, I'd like to take it more, do this in, in a one-sided interactive fashion, let's call it that way, by responding to some of the points that you also raised. Um, so talking about music information retrieval. Um, Stephen Downey, one of the founders of the, of the field and of the ISMIR conference, um, calls it a multidisciplinary research endeavor that strives to develop innovative content-based searching schemes, novel interfaces, and evolving network delivery mechanisms in an effort to make the world's vast store of music accessible to all. Um, you see many of these things that, we, that came up already, content-based search, analyzing audio signals, um, building interfaces, um, accessing music collections, this network delivery um, question that was 2004, so that was all before people were listening to music through the internet basically all the time, that was still when there were offline collections. Um, so this is um, one, one, one definition, but it's also another definition I don't have on the slides, which is that actually it's m information retrieval in the sense that we're trying to recover information from the audio signal. So it can also be seen as that, you know, there's information stored in the audio signals and we want to access that information. And this is what you see in m many of the applications actually. Um, the extraction of musically relevant information from a signal or related media, and this pertains to a lot of things like event detection in time, um, detecting where the onsets in the signal, where the beats in the signal, um, where's the downbeat, um, going more into um, 
musical structure, um, uh, extracting tonal properties, um, information about the instruments, the timbre, and so on. A lot of it is dealing with transcription um, from an audio recording to a symbolic representation. We will see an example of that. Um, with music indexing and classification, this is more the classic information retrieval approach, I would say, and uh, a lot of it is dealing also with music similarity, whatever that actually means. How can we define similarity of music pieces for retrieval, but also for other um, um, applications? Um, you see that in many popular applications. We've heard about recommender systems. Probably everybody uses Spotify or a similar platform to listen to music. And um, you get the feed of, in, uh, of music that's relevant for you. And this is an application of music information retrieval. Um, recommender system community would say it's an application of recommender systems, but this is where they meet. Um, you see things like personalized radio stations, but also um, tools like um, you see with Shazam, audio identification. Um, which music piece am I listening to? What am I hearing here uh, from a distorted version of a, uh, of a signal? But then there's um, a different side where this um, information that we extract from music signals can also be used for music creation, uh, specifically things like transcription, um, in order to do things like modification of, of existing sounds, uh, generating new sounds, varying existing um, musical ideas. And um, this can also be taken to a real life uh, or to, um, to a, a real time uh, context, for instance, in live performances where the system is able to follow what's going on in the performance and react correspondingly. It could be a visualization, could be an improvisation, um, some, something like this. But in all of these cases, we need to understand what the music is about, what's in the music, what's happening. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the listening side as an application, but really on the creation side, going from transcription and how we can use that for for variation. So start with the uh, drum transcription. Um, what is drum transcription? Okay, we have an audio file, some recording, we put it through an automatic drum transcription system, and what we get out of that is a transcript in terms of the notes that are played. Um, in our case, we have, in, in most of the cases, we have three instruments that are relevant here, bass, snare, and hi-hat, and then we have a symbolic representation. So um, for instance, we have a recording that sounds like this. So that's a drum track, and now we're interested in a symbolic representation of that. Um, so we put it through the system, we get the symbolic representation, what do we do with that? Well, for instance, we put it into a drum sampler, and what it does is spits out an uh, audio representation of that again. Which sounds pretty much what we had, what we heard before. Um, not exactly the same, but, but very similar, so you might ask yourself the question, why would we want to do that? Um, why do, are we interested in analyzing an audio signal just to produce a similar audio signal? Um, well, because the story is not always that easy. I mean, we might have a recording like this. Which is a polyphonic recording, there's accompaniment, etc. Now we still want to extract the drum track from that, um, which could sound like this after the whole process. which is the drum pattern you heard before. Again, why would that be interesting? Um, well, we might want to change the drum kit, for instance. And if we have a symbolic representation, that's very easy to do. So let's say we want to transfer an existing piece of music into a different style. We want to change uh, certain sound parameters, etc. cetera. Um, this is a way of like music information retrieval is the step you have to go through in order to be able to do that. Um, so okay, so I think you have the idea of why this is why this is actually interesting. Um, actually, beyond uh, beyond this, um, there's uh, certain MIR tasks that are depending on these low-level steps or these these, um, uh, these extractions. Um, for instance, if you want to use or extract these features for genre classification for segmenting songs, um, which is important for um, electronic dance music styles and so on, where we actually need to know uh, this um, rhythmic information more than other things. Um, and you can use it for generating sheet music, but also music production. I talked about this. Um, so what is the step? Um, what, I what are we doing here? And, I'm, um, and how does this work, what, what we're doing here? I'm trying not to bore you with the details of how, how this works. Uh, basically, what we're doing in most of these cases is a machine learning, a traditional machine learning based approach, um, where we start from the audio file, which is in this waveform. Then we have this waveform representation. We um, transfer that um, through Fourier transformed into a spectrogram representation. So we're in the um, time frequency domain here. Um, and what we do then is classify aspects of this representation um, based on, in our case, a neural network, 
So this is the machine learning approach here in the middle, which is then responsible for extracting the relevant features, um, <coughs> for detecting the events, and for uh, performing the classification. Um, in neural networks or with um, machine learning, what is really important here um, is that these ne networks need to be trained beforehand. So we need to give good examples of what is actually the outcome that we'd like to, uh, like to have. So we need a lot of training data. So I'm not going to give you the excursion on, on machine learning, but this is definitely one of the prerequisites here that we do have a lot of um, high quality annotations that allow us to teach the system with, to tell, you this is, to tell the system this is what we'd like to have. And so we give examples. And once we've given these examples and once the network has been trained, the network is then capable of, of um, finding these patterns again. And we end up typically with, the, with these activation functions for three different classes that we train it with. And not all of that is correct, so there's some post-processing. But basically the idea is at which point in time is which instrument active, and this is the symbolic representation that we're, that we're getting. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to bore you with these, but in this case, um, we're using a recurrent neural network. So deep learning is the prevalent thing here. Um, of course, this is what we, what we see everywhere, and it has basically taken over every single task in music information retrieval in the, in the past five, six years, I think. Um, so we also do that. I'm um, not going to tell you the details about that. I'm also not going to tell you the details that the approach that we're having performs extraordinarily well and more than better than the state of the art and the stair and the competitors and so on. Um, you can see it. You can also just trust me on that. Um, I'll give you an example of what it, what it does. So here's an, an example of a transcription of the drum tracks uh, for a track that's called Hendrix, which is from one of the research databases, the MedleyDB. Um, it's not a track by Jimi Hendrix, it's a track that reminds people of Jimi Hendrix has been composed in that way. And what you will hear is um, the original recording, um, and then as it goes on, it will fade out or fade uh, crossfade to the synthesized transcription of, of what we extracted from it, and then we'll go back. So we will hear that it's capable of extracting the drum track there. Oh, we can't hear that, unfortunately. Okay. All right. I'm sure this worked just before when we tested it. Oh, yeah. now I also get the spinning. <laughs> strange. Strange, very strange. Is there something wrong with Keynote today? <laughs> okay, let's just try again. Let me try again by restarting this because it just deleted the slide apparently. <laughs> no, I just skipped it. Okay. No, it's not working. Okay. Um, all right. I'll restart. Sorry for that. Ich vielleicht probiere einen anderen Adapter. Ich versuche mal mit dem. No, okay. Vielleicht liegt es an dem. Ja, kann sein. Okay, the adapter got too hot apparently. That's the maybe the reason. Okay, let's try this one. Also not. Okay. <laughs> this is strange. All right, so I will give you the examples once we're, once we're done with this, and I'll bring them up. I can sing it. Yeah, I don't remember the song. It's not that, that famous, but anyway. Um, okay, y but you've seen the example beforehand where you saw how we, w how we do the transcription of a, of, a, of a recording, and this was another example of that. And as soon as I get it to run, I'll show you the example of this. Um, let's hope the other examples um, are, are working, so this will be, should be more interesting now. Um, so, I, so once we have this, uh, this transcription, um, we have this um, symbolic representation of the audio. Um, we can we can work with it in a more um, let's say well-behaved fashion. It's much easier for us to to um, 
um, to do something with this. Um, and now we'd like to apply it in the task um, we call drum pattern variation, where we do have a large pool of drum patterns extracted, and now we're interested in making variations of these drum patterns, just similar to what Sergi showed before, where we can explore the space. So um, it's going to be it's very much along those lines, and it's also an outcome of the GiantSubs project. So I mean, this is this is you, you know the you know the drill basically already, um, but um, um, the idea or the background of this is again that. Um, we see that imitation um, is a goal of, of, uh, of machine learning and AI general, but generally, and what we'd like to do is uh, generate this um, statistically similar or statistically indistinguishable uh, instances based on a training set. And this has been very popularized by the, by the image domain again, um, where, for instance, um, last or two years ago at iClear, there was a paper where it was all, um, where a computer was generating images of celebrities that did not exist. So just faces of people that look like celebrities, but they're not celebrities because this is just all based on, on examples of celebrities. Um, and you find this in different domains. Um, and most of these use something like this variational auto encoder, um, generative um, um, adversarial networks, um, which seem very popular and very capable of, of doing that in, in all different types of domains. And it uses some latent space uh, where it projects it into, and this space can then be used to have some high-level control. I'm not going to go into detail about these kind of things, but the idea here is that we're generating something that looks like it, it, it could be real. And so we're interested in doing the same thing with, with music and these drum patterns. We have this um, large um, um, repository of existing drum patterns, so we'd like to generate some that could be made by human, even though they were not. Um, so yeah, the, um, several um, uh, you find that in several domains, um, but yeah. Um, the idea is basically always the same. So what is drum pattern variation for us now? Let's say we start with a basic pattern, and I hope we have some sound on that one. We do. Wow, nice bass there. Um, so this is a seat pattern we're putting into, and now what could be variation? We, we'd like to keep the main characteristic of this pattern, um, but we'd like to, for instance, um, add some details to increase the intensity of the same, let's say, musical idea or rhythmic idea. Or alternatively, we could um, we could reduce this um, this complexity by just omitting uh, some of these um, um, of these um, um, beats, and then um, making still preserving the idea, which is not a very great idea here, to be honest, but still make a less dense version of that of that same uh, rhythmic pattern. Um, and why is that interesting? Well. We, we've heard this before, and I completely agree with this. We could use this as an inspirational tool. Um, the ter uh, terminology for this in the, in the CHI community, in the com uh, human-computer interaction community, is co-creation for this. So this is one of the hot topics really there. How can we use AI in order to um, do something that um, is um, inspirational, that increases creativity, that increases productivity maybe, not to replace um, the user in this in this process, but to do something where a machine can help um, the user and the human to create something, um, and for for this purpose, this would be this would be a tool. So we can use that in music production. Um, again, I mentioned live performances. Maybe if it's a bit more experimental and you trust uh, trust the machine that something interesting comes out. Um, but of course, and this is actually the main point I will get to, then there are many challenges involved with this. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the, of the drum pattern variation too much now because I want to get to another point uh, about the general um, concept here or where this is going in my opinion. Um, again, we're using deep learning even though it's not very deep in this case, it's a very shallow um, deep learning um, model here. We're using a restricted Boltzmann machine in order to do that. But basically we're training a, a deep learning model with all these patterns that, that we extract or that come from a database and then saying, okay, generate me something new that follows this overall trend, this overall um, patterns that we saw in the repository before and training data. Um, and we built this into a little application, um, which is the drum, this little um, step sequencer. And we have this style at the, at the bottom where we can say, okay, we want these patterns to be making me a variation of that and make me a less complex variation or make me a more complex variation. I'll show you this briefly uh, if it works or not. Nope, doesn't work. So you basically ask it, this is the seed, make me a variation of this. Mm -hmm. 
And again, this is not trained with the pattern that was inserted, but uh, from a large pool of possible patterns and from the one that you start with, it tries to come up with something that goes along these lines. I'm keeping this very short. Um, because for me now, or what, what happens now in, in MIR or in this type of research, and this is becoming more, more interesting, um, what really becomes complex now is the quality assessment. Is that good, what that thing generates? It's very easy to build that, right? You have a, you have a system that, that does that, um, that outputs new patterns and they sound interesting, they sound nice, all of that. But really the challenge is, how good is that system? Is it better than another one? I mean, how can we do science with this kind of stuff, really, if, if we don't have any quality measure to this? And this is actually the crucial part we ha we're having here, not only with music um, generation, but with all these generative approaches. Like, how, how good is this stuff? So we don't, have this, we don't have ground truth, which is actually what we're always referring to when or resorting to when we do machine learning. We have our database where we say, okay, these are the positive examples and negative examples, and then we measure how well this is predicted. In this case, there's something new coming out and we have no idea if it's, if it's good or not, unless a human looks at it and says, well, that makes sense or makes no sense. And now we're in this exactly in this situation that we're not running a lot, a lot of experiments anymore where we, have, where we can optimize things easily, but we always have to have, in a way, the human in the loop saying like, yeah, that's good, that's not good, um, which slows down this development process massively. So of course, computer scientists don't want to do that, asking humans for every iteration of whatever they're doing. Um, but, um, but this is actually the situation. So we're dealing with performance indicators and uh, similarity metrics that are very subjective, that are depend very much on the context. Um, and if we want to optimize our systems beyond what we have in the training data already, this is very challenging. So what we have to do really is, is user-based evaluation. Um, and this is one of the things we did also in the Giant Steps project very early on. So I think we are very on the forefront when it comes to these kind of things um, that we try to um, have to get the user, um, bring the user back into, these, into the development of these tools and finding out whether that makes sense what we're doing here. And that can happen in a quantitative way by doing surveys and questionnaires. Um, it can happen in a more qualitative way by doing interviews, for instance. But where we're going, and maybe this is where, where it's interesting, maybe I can take away or hopefully reduce the skepticism a bit about music information retrieval. Um, we're going into very user-centric design of these tools and of the algorithms that we're, that we're doing, or at least we have to go into this direction because in terms of you know, what we can do with ground truth, I think we're, we're very much at the, at the um, yeah, very much there what we can do. But now it's more interesting to find out what people do with that type of information and what is useful to them. So I mentioned um, surveys, and we did this with uh, with this pattern generation, and um, Sergi was also involved in um, in this study. Um, and but the question here really is already to ask: What do you ask people? What to evaluate for? You ask them: Is this interesting? Is this novel? Would you use that? You know, what are the what are the criteria that you ask people in order to evaluate something that is generated automatically by an algorithm? Um, kind of these things. You know, is it? in a way creative, what you would um, ask other people whether this is, this is good. So yeah, you see things like, well, it's interesting, or I would use it for a substitution or for a fill for it's spe uh, specific to drum tracks. Um, but we also did um, expert interviews. So we tried to do these feedback sessions and then ask people about what, what if that was good or not, um, doing these test sessions, feedback sessions, peer conversations, etc. Uh, sometimes also with non-functional prototypes. So this goes very much into um, uh, participat participatory design, re research through design, etc., um, where we're trying to involve the experts directly into the type of things we want to develop. And the reason I'm telling you this is because there's some interesting findings. I'm just going to hint at them uh, now, but I think this is really interesting because it totally <laughs> proves the point of the, of the interaction, of the discussion that's going on um, already. Um, so from these inter interviews, um, just some highlights from what we, what we got from people. Um, we we're talking about recommender systems also for creative work. So basically generating or giving people something generated by a machine as a suggestion. And we asked people in the creative process, would you want to use that? And they said, actually, no, <laughs> we, don't, we don't want that. We thought that was the greatest technological opportunity we could give them. You know, we do a system, we build a system algorithmically that gives you all new opportunities. What do musicians say? We don't want it. Um, they say, I'm happy for it to make suggestions, especially if I can ignore them. That's not a very um, encouraging statement, actually. Um, what is the reason for that? Because when you ask people about a recommender system, what they have in mind is Amazon recommender system. So people who did this also did that. 
Now that's the least thing that any creative person or musician in, for in this situation spe uh, specifically wants, really. So one thing that's a problem is, okay, you know, this is going to tell me what I have to do. You know, it's, uh, give me that as long as I'm saying do this and do that. So if I can invoke it, maybe. But really the big issue here is this, the, uh, the concept of artistic originality. That, that, that's, I mean, for any artist who really is an artist, that's one of the central goods that they have and they're not going to give up. So we have this quote, as soon as I feel this is something you would uh, suggest to this other guy as well, and then he might come up with uh, the same melody, that feels not good to me. But if this engine kind of looked what I did so far in this track as someone sitting next to me, so in the sense of imitating what I'm doing, picking up my own style, you know, picking up what is it that makes me this specific artist or what is uh, that makes me special. Maybe if it can do that, then, then I'm happy with this. And the other question or the other uh, quote we're having here is, uh, with this, it's really like, you know, who is the composer of this? So if the machine, again, if the machine is generating that and you're using that in your own work, are you really the author of that? I think that's a really important question. I mean, there's always the question coming from people more interested in legal terms, you know, who has the copyright, who the, has the ownership of all that. But for artists, the question really is, am I still the artist after, after I'm using these kind of tools? And I think this is something we really have to keep in mind when we build these things. Um, and this is why co-creation is such an important thing, because it's not a matter of generating music. So this is where, where I differ, because it's not about generating music. Um, that algorithms can do that for whatever purpose, you know, when you don't have a composer at hand in a way. But um, the point really is to bring people into this process and make sure they feel they have agency in this process and they can change things. And there's a reason why it sounds the way it sounds in the end. It's because they interact that, that way and they, with the system doing certain things, but they know how to play that system and how to operate it such that they are the ones causing the, the output. Um, so I'm coming to conclusions and, and, and future work. This is going to be a bit more, more technical here. Um, oh, it's also the wrong set of slides. It doesn't matter. Um, so I tried to convince you that music information retrieval is a driver in innovation in the music ecosystem. So it's not only you know, boring analyzing what's in the audio and then who does anything with that. It's a necessary step in order to facilitate interaction for all the applications that come afterwards. Um, what we do need, and this is maybe the answer to the question, where where is the music in there? Um, well, it, it it's the music. The music is definitely in in the in the person uh, perceiving it in the end, but in our modeling and what what do how do we build systems that actually reflect the music? Um, it's very much domain specific. We cannot just take one of these image things, even though you know in, uh, conceptually they're very similar. But we have to know what to look for. We have to design this. So. It's not the typical deep learning end-to-end, -end, you know, it, the system solves it all. Um, these things are very much tuned to what they're supposed to solve. So we have to know very well um, what, is, what is relevant, how does music work, um, what are the concepts that we're looking for in order to build these systems. Um, this is what makes it uh, special for music information retrieval. Um, we have to know about um, how, uh, ideally, we would know more about um, how, how similarity, how music perception works in order to build that into some sort of, um, some error functions maybe to get closer to what, what humans do. Um, and basically, this is the, the main takeaway from me here. Co-creation will be a central task for, for future AI systems. So I don't think it's the generation of music alone, but it's this task of co-creation. And in order to do that, design and evaluation need to overcome the purely system-centric views which were dominant in uh, probably music information retrieval for a long time, but don't work, um, don't work as well anymore. So for the first couple of steps, that, that worked over very well. Personally, what I think is, is what we can do, I mean, apart from the overarching ideas, but um, where are like actual research, <coughs> sorry, research directions heading, um, or where's our research heading, um, is things like a uh, joint learning of musical dimensions. So far, we've done a lot of, um, you know, like learning a task for drum transcription, or building a model for drum transcription, building a model for onset detection, building a model for, um, um, I don't know, key estimation, and, and all these things individually. But actually, these things have, they, they play together. So we should really try to come up with systems that do all these things simultaneously, um, which should probably, I mean, it's, that's quite challenging, but in the end, it should help. Um, what we do need is interdisciplinary exchange um, with music psychology, for instance. Um, I think this is this is uh, crucial for us. I mentioned already, like maybe uh, psychologically um, better motivated uh, similarity measures, etc. Um, generally, an understanding of the user um, is is crucial for us. I mean. Um, 
the, the modeling of users in, in computer science is um, it, it, it's done, but I think it's far from where it where it should be. Um, with um, the limitations that you know, there's always the chance of um, of privacy um, boundaries, etc. That uh, depending on how far you get in that user modeling, so you might model more than you should actually. But in order for things like you know, to how music perception works for individuals, it <coughs> might be uh, might be good. And, uh, and on, on top of that, the modeling of user intent. So why are people actually listening to music? Which thing are they trying to or what are they trying to accomplish when they create a music piece there's different purposes that they uh, compose for etc um, so these models only work when we know what what it's what it's good for and whether people are looking for diverse things or like uh, continuation etc and central thing here is data quality because it's machine learning and data has a massive impact on what the outcome will be so um, thank you very much for your attention